Uh, well, welcome everybody to Manchester Art Gallery. It's really great to see you here on a rainy Thursday evening in November. Um, my name is Meg Parnell and I work in the learning team here at the gallery. Uh, and when I first uh, encountered uh, Hiteng Patel's work and met with him, um, we, we were kind of really interested in the kind of discussion that might come out of his work. I hope that most of you in the room have seen his fantastic film that's uh, showing in our ground floor gallery. If you haven't, um, then you need to go after this event. <laughs> um, and I, when I saw the film, the, the first where we talked, um, we thought there was a really interesting kind of subject here about around how we communicate as human beings without using words. So we thought we'd have a discussion event <laughs> with words. But um, uh, we thought we'd open it up to everybody. And that's why we've invited some of Hatane's collaborators on the film to come here this evening um, and so we can have a discussion. But it is also your event, so we'd like you to contribute. If there are burning thoughts that you've had since you've seen Hatane's work, then this is the moment to talk about them. Um, so I'm just going to introduce everybody first of all and explain how the event's going to work. Um, so, Hitain Patel is here, <laughs> uh, and also Louise Stern. Uh, Louise is a writer who collaborated uh, with Hitain on the um, film. Shirak Luko is here. Shirak is a choreographer and martial arts expert, and I was just reading the massive list of... Um, so, I'm just going to read this. A multidisciplinary performer, choreographer, director, specialising in physical theatre... Circus acrobats, martial arts, and magic. Um, uh, so yeah, a real Renaissance uh, man. So, <laughs> great. So what we're going to do is each um, uh, of the of the uh, panel here are going to present um, for a, for about ten minutes their work and talk about um, their work. And I've asked each of them the question: um, What is the importance and role of non-verbal communication? Um, using our bodies to communicate in the world today. So that's the question I've asked them to um, kind of answer in their, own, in their own way. And then after that, we will open it up for your comments, your questions, um, and we'll have a discussion about that topic. So, uh, I haven't worked that, actually. Who'd like to go first? Hatane, would you like to go first? Sure. <laughs> <coughs> okay, well, uh, thanks, everybody, for coming. Um, I, I should also say that as well as the, the films in the exhibition, in the screening room uh, we've made a number of behind the scenes videos which go into different aspects of the filmmaking process. So I'd really encourage you to uh, have a look uh, at those, they're quite short. And so I'm going to try not to repeat too much of, of what's in those to kind of uh, add a bit of extra here. I'm just going to keep an eye on time so I don't blab on. Um, okay, so. My work, I guess, uh, in my artwork, a lot of the activity that I do, I would say, well, I, I feel differently about this on different days, but one way of saying it is that I'm interested in kind of upturning expectations about people's identities, about what we might think of somebody um, from how they look or how they sound or what they're dressed like. Um, and I'm interested to do this um, almost as like um, a political act um, towards freedom. You know, I like the idea of trying to um, make our identities a bit slippier and so that we kind of have the freedom to exist outside of what's expected of us. Um, and that sounds kind of heavy. Uh, so what I do in my work is try to uh, approach that through humour and through entertainment. Um, and so, for example, in the films that I made for the, for the gallery, they, they're very kind of Hollywood-like. Um, so they have a big orchestral soundtrack, there's kind of drama in there, uh, hopefully you see humour in there, um, and they kind of operate in this um, visual, sonic language um, that we're used to seeing uh, on the big screen, in films, in advertising. Um, but talking about those things about identity. 
Um, so one of the ways that I do this um, in terms of upturning your identities and, and questioning those things is trying to create connections between people and communities um, that we're kind of told in society don't fit together um, or they don't meet or, they, or typically. Um, so I'm interested in, and I'm particularly interested in doing this with uh, what I'd call marginalised identities. Um, whether that's to do with race or gender or class. Uh, and so taking a marginalised identity, let's say um, uh, an Afro-Caribbean identity or an Indian identity, and, can, and some of these identities which might be considered marginalised or exotic uh, in, the, in Western society, and connecting them with something that we do recognise, Hollywood, entertainment, action, romance, uh, and kind of building these connections uh, through my artwork. Um, and so, because I, my aim is to do that, um, I'm interested in languages that kind of go, span across different communities uh, that, are non, that are not culture specific. Uh, and I guess in a way, coming back to, Met, coming to Meg's question, this is why I'm quite interested in uh, non-verbal, physical communication. So in all of my work it involves the body. Uh, the presence of the body. Quite often it's mine or my family's. Uh, in Don't Look at the Finger, it's one of the rare times that it's uh, a cast that's uh, different from my own ethnicity or that are not related to me. Um, and one of the reasons that the body's so present is because I think, I feel like bodies um, transmit so much information. Um, you know, we all know that kind of spoken and verbal communication forms such a tiny amount of how we communicate. There's so much in our body language, our gestures, our tone. You know, if you don't speak the same language as someone, you can still very quickly tell if they're friendly towards you, or hostile, or flirting with you, or if they shouldn't be flirting with you. Um, and so, you know, all these we kind of transmit physically somehow. So I've always been interested in that. Uh, and I've always been interested in it as a possible way to um, free myself of um, what's expected of me as a brown man uh, in England, maybe. Um, and so, you know, what can my body do? What can I do that might not be expected of me? Maybe if I'm speaking Chinese, or maybe if I'm doing acrobats or Kung Fu, or something that's culturally, that's culturally not, that doesn't fit with an Indian body. Um, so I'm interested in those things. And hopefully you see that in the films, uh, in, in the gallery as well, in terms of what we might expect and, and what we get. Um, doing okay. Uh, so this, so, so I think that's, that's also what has drawn me to other physical, um, non-verbal communication. So, you know, things that the body does that's kind of quite dynamic and dramatic, such as dance such as martial arts. Uh, you know, I'm kind of, I don't have any training or background in those, but I'm kind of physically drawn to them. Or, you know, if you see a music video or if you're dancing in a club, you know, these things that can't necessarily talk about why we're drawn to it, we just physically are. Um, and then also sign language. Um, I initially came across uh, with a, from the distance that maybe many people experience for the first time on TV interpretation uh, for programs, um, and, but I've always been fascinated by it. And it was only when I met, um, when I did a project in 2014 uh, for a dance company, da can do good dance company, that I, I worked with uh, a couple of deaf theatre practitioners and some interpreters that started my journey into um, looking at sign language creatively. And then it was when I met Louise, um, through uh, a theatre acquaintance of ours, that things really kind of exploded in terms of um, more, I guess, going into language further, and in particular, physical language, whether it's linguistic or whether it's non-linguistic. Um, and so Louise and I started a dialogue uh, then uh, about that. We worked together on a live performance together and it was kind of a no-brainer for me to invite Louise to work with me on Don't Look at the Finger. 
Chirag and I were both on a, were brought in to work with another artist, a dance artist, um, and that's where we first met. Um, and then I, I really loved Chirag from that moment, you know, like, um, you know, seeing him work, how he thinks. <laughs> Um, and and so even though I never worked with him before, I knew for this project he was kind of the man for it, and uh, so I invited him to kind of come in on it. And uh, both Chirag and Louise and all my other collaborators, costume designer, uh, the sound designer, there's a composer, there's there's lots of collaborators. I tend to work individually to start with with each of these collaborators and develop a kind of quite in-depth dialogue with each person, which I, which I love doing and I learn so much from. And that influence is kind of where the vision of the work is going. And then at some point in the process, um, a lot of the collaborators meet, uh, we're in a space together. So in the rehearsal process of choreographing uh, Vicky and Freddie, the main protagonists in the film, Louise and Chirag, and also the costume designer Holly, were quite often in a space together and so people's roles start to blur a bit who's the choreographer who's the writer who's the costume designer who's the director and i feel like when you have the right people in the room i feel like the kind of in-depth conversations to start with i feel like puts us in a, on the same page towards the same vision and and i think uh when you have that in the room I feel like everyone is really generous with their ideas like, I feel like everyone's in a place of, you forget whose ideas are what. You're just kind of all driving towards uh, the end goal. And, 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 you know, honestly, when I see that working there, I'm wowed by it. And uh, <laughs> I'm kind of like, I, I sort of half joke about it. I, I can't, I almost can't remember how it happened. You know, kind of, it felt like a, a whirlwind and kind of it's like, whoa. Um, and so I guess that's, uh, a bit about how that work came about and also um, I was, a lot of my visual art work, video work, doesn't include uh, spoken text um, and, and so I'm interested in what visually, physically bodies can transmit um, and I'm interested in that that is in, in a, a toolkit to make connections between what's on screen or what's in the art space and an audience that come into that space and, and what can do um, to make those connections. Uh, and, and often it's kind of trying to find something quite human uh, about whoever's on, on screen or, um, or in the artwork. So you can, the idea is that you would be able to relate to uh, what's happening in the screen. Like, if I describe it on paper, um, the film, it could describe it as an Afro Kung Fu sign language film, which sounds a bit crazy. Uh, but, you know, if, if you don't know that and you go to see the work, hopefully it doesn't feel crazy. You know, I guess in a way I like the idea that there's lots of things in there which you might consider to be exotic or other or fictional or whatever, but that through um, this language of Hollywood, this entertaining um, kind of thing that pervades it, that they should make sense together, that you can all also, it, it can feel familiar, hopefully, and that you can recognize things, or maybe you can see some of yourself in something that you might not expect it to see yourself in. I think I might be at the end of my time. I think you might be. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, <Hatay>. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, should we say, we'll save questions, if you've got questions directly for Hattain, then we'll just save them till the discussion bit. Um, okay, so I'd just like to ask Louise if she'd like to um, talk about her work. So I'm going to start by saying that I'm using American Sign Language. I'm American myself, um, but I'm also fluent in British Sign Language. But the reason why I'm using ASL now is I have an established relationship with Helsa, the current interpreter, and I believe um, it's important to use the same interpreter throughout the course of the work, um, and that allows for fluidity. Um, but we have the British Sign Language interpreters here for the um, British Deaf attendees. But I wanted to make sure that everybody knew that, and it's also a really good lead-in 
to what I'm interested in. I'm interested in the idea of labeling and labeling things via words. And that process has an impact on all of us. It impacts our daily communication. Often we say things and we say them again and again and again until we forget what they actually mean. We forget what emotions feel like. We forget what things smell like. We forget, we forget how it feels to walk in an environment. We've become too familiar with how we talk about them. So I am the fourth generation um, of deafness in my family. We use a very physical language. And with sign languages, you have, your relationship with the world is, is different. And I'd like to think that you're often less likely to forget certain things. Because how you express yourself requires your body. And your body reminds you of what things smell like. Your body reminds you of how things feel. And at the same time, you're a member of a community of people who are misunderstood. You feel like your experience has allowed you to express yourself only in certain ways. Words like disabled. What does that word even mean? I've got no idea still. And my frustration with those types of things has led me to try and create art through writing. So through writing, I'm interested in exploring different types of communication, um, which, which allows me to sort of investigate these ideas. And I feel like using different ways of looking at it, so writing fiction, um, making visual art, um, it allows me to it allows me to break free of the cliches, the cliches that um, exist within the, the, the methods of communication um, that, we, that we use. So I'm going to show a, a piece of work, um, which is a part of my visual art. Um, it's called Eruption. And in Eruption, it shows a way of communicating that deaf people who are sign language users have access to that comes up in daily conversation. And I don't, th I think that people that, it's not, so these ways of communicating are not open to people that speak or write. So can we show that now? I find it really interesting. Um, so Hitten and I met, and he invited me to collaborate with him after reading a book that I had written. So it's been really interesting from a book um, which inspired, a, phys inspired a, phys a physical collaboration. And to me, this means that we're both interested in the intent, in the meaning, and not how it's expressed. We're interested in the, in the intent, in the meaning itself. And that really shows in his work. He doesn't talk about race or socioeconomic uh, class issues. And, and you often forget um, the feeling of the people because you, we often talk about labeling. We talk about categories. We talk about politics in a way that has become very confining. And the work that we do is not about disability. And it's been one of the most freeing experiences creative, cre creatively that I've had. And as a creative person, you want to make work that is, that is everything. It's impossible to do, but it's what you want to do. 
So when you collaborate with other artists, you want to feel things. You want to feel things that give you what, perhaps new angles. Things that you can't do in your own work on your own because you've been following a stream, a stream of your own instinct, a stream of your own hunches that have led you to your subsequent projects. But there's so much more outside of that. And you might be curious about all these other things. But it's really rare that a collaboration brings you somewhere that has, that has meat in it. And, and working with Hattain has been one of those very rare occurrences for me. And it's taken me somewhere that feels very real. How much time do I have left? I've got two minutes. minutes. Okay. Mm -hmm. I think that by getting beyond the preconceived notions, ideas about what it means to be black, what it means to be Asian, what it means to be disabled, creating a world that feels complete. That's actually given um, more politics and contributes more to politics than anything that has been um, made with those expectations set out initially could ever have done. And I'm really grateful to Hattain for that. I think I'm done. Thank you, Louise. And just to say, this is Louise's fantastic novel, Ishmael and Her Sisters. So if you haven't read this, then I really recommend that you read this book because um, you get a real sense of language, the hearing world, deaf world. Um, it's, it, it just sort of changes, shifts your, if you're a hearing person, it shifts your perspective so much. So definitely recommend this book. Um, okay, so thank you, Louise. Now I'm going to ask Chirac to talk about his work. Um, so, yeah. Brilliant. Well, thank you for the <laughs> introduction, Meg. So as Meg said, <coughs> I'm a multidisciplinary performer and creator and basically what this means is that I am very committed to the art that we create but not attached to the style or the method that we use to create that art. So my background is really in martial arts. When I was about three or four years old my parents put me into a martial arts class because they heard some health benefits would help me and you know whenever you start something for the first time you never know where it will end up if you just carry on going. So. That's what that was, and because I really lacked in confidence, um, they also pushed me towards being in the school plays every so often, so I was in that, and that's really how I started and got an interest in both performing and in the martial arts. And I wasn't very good at anything else, actually. I was just wasn't very good at anything, like in school. I couldn't read until I was eight, so I wasn't, I was generally not very good at anything else. Um, so these were the kind of two things that my parents supported. They like tripled down on the things that I was good at and supported the things that I was not so good at. So it kind of progressed from there. And as time went on, I decided that maybe it was time to go to university and work on getting a real job. So my route into performing world is slightly different because I did a degree in psychology and my intention was to go and be a psychologist. But while I was there, again, just drawing on those skills that I had was I was working in a theater, so as an usher, so that I could watch the same shows over and over again and get an understanding of how they were directed from each door, how the choreography worked and how it looked. So that's what I was doing while at university. And as time went on, I started performing magic because I had this interest in magic since I was a little kid. Um, I went to see the Russian State Circus when I was about five and uh, a magician came on stage and he did these cool tricks and he did this amazing magic and they had come to our school to do a bit of a workshop in juggling so I asked my parents if we could go and like it was like my birthday present or something it was like this big event we went to the Russian circus and I got this interest in circus and in that kind of performance so I'd always been learning but as I said I couldn't read until I was about eight so uh, my parents taught me magic by reading the Paul Daniels magic book <laughs> and showing me with the cards so that's how I learned magic and at university I, I was doing psychology so I thought I'd like to keep performing and one of the ways were that in the student union 
I started to do some magic and I put out a challenge that at that time Darren Brown, the magician, was quite big. How many by a show of hands know Darren Brown yet? <laughs> so it was quite big, so I had gone to see one of his shows and I knew that because it was live, nobody had seen it yet. But obviously knowing so much about magic, I knew how everything in that show was done, so I thought I'd replicate the show and present it. And I presented a um, challenge to the university lecturers, because they were all doctors of psychology, that if anybody could work out how I do what I do, then I'd give them 10,000 pounds, which I didn't have at the time. <laughs> um, and that's how I got the audience. That was one way of my Marketing. So the audience came and they, they did this, and we, we did this show, but it eventually became known as Myth, and I taught it for four years while at university. So I toured around the country and did pretty well. I mean, again, I put these challenges out, and psychics came, and, and psychologists, and physicists, and all of these people came, and, and it went well, and nobody ever won the £10,000. So that was good, unfortunate, very lucky for me. So I continued performing, but after university, you know, at the height of this recession, I was trying to look for that real job, and I, I, I started having a conversation with somebody who became a mentor, and she asked me a question. She said, what do you specifically want to do? And I said, I want to talk about things that are happening in the world and empower people to make those things better. And she said, and what is the vehicle to achieve that? And I said, creating theater. And she was like, well, then you shouldn't be doing psychology, you should be creating theater. Um, and again, while I was at university, I had the opportunity to work with other people. So uh, I took on a job to go and perform in Dubai, which was a week long, but I performed for royalty and I performed for these big events and it paid for my first year. So I was really interested in getting that sorted, uh, paying for the first year of university. So I went and did this and those same directors and choreographers then started to hire me to create choreography, martial arts choreography, fight choreography. And by this time I'd won national golds, represented England and won some world championships. So I'd represented England around the world at this time for about two or three years just before university had started. Um, so I was doing all of these things and it just, it just went from that point. It was just like a cycle, it just continued. And I eventually gave up the idea of looking for a real job and continued down the path of creating theatre. And everything that I do has to connect to this why, the reason that I started in the first place. And that is to talk about things that are happening in the world. So when I say yes to a project, I always think, does it fulfill these two criteria? One, will I be able to make a contribution and serve this project on the highest level? By which I mean, will my contribution serve the audience that it sees? Will I be able to add value to the audience and their life? And the second thing is that I believe that art should be like a mirror held up to reality. So we talk about these things subtly that are happening in the world, but also with that we empower the the world and the audience with the hammer with which to shape that reality. So those are the two things that I really look for. So over the last year, like I said, I'm committed to creating art with that purpose but not attached to what it has to be. So over the last 12 months, for example, just to give you a little bit of a, an idea of the work, if I may, um, it's been, I worked on a concert to do with Charlie Chaplin, which spoke about the British Empire and the good and the bad that that did. And I had I worked on a musical which taught 72 venues, which was talking about women's right and gender equality. And then I worked on I Dream, which was a promenade performance, a multi-disciplinary, again, performance, which had lots of visual art, lots of performing arts, and I directed and choreographed this. It was based on a Midsummer Night's Dream. And then <coughs> I worked with Hidane, and just after working with Hithane, I worked on an outdoor theatre show, which was called The Story of Light. And that was, again, <coughs> multidisciplinary, lots of different art forms coming together, because this is what really stirs my soul and makes me tick. I really think, like, these, these collaborators that I've, have had the opportunity to work with, like Louise and Hidane, they've already mentioned that when we collaborate, when we work together, we create something. And I said it in the video that's downstairs, and I say it again because it's really something that I believe, that when two or more people come together towards a unified goal, they create a third invisible thing that nothing, nobody could achieve individually. And I think that that's great. If we can work together, we can create something that none of us would have been able to create 
by ourselves. And all of these things have to layer on top of each other. And this really only happens when we're just open and willing and accepting to those things. Because otherwise, everyone's got their own idea of what needs to happen. And while we're trying to create this stallion horse, we actually end up with a cat. <coughs> and that's not, what we're, that's not really what we're looking for. So we, we're working on, on this project. And I met Hidane, like he says, through another project that we were working on. Hidane was um, the dramaturg. Yeah. Dramaturg, consultant, I was directing, co-choreographing at the time, it's touring now, and um, we didn't even have the opportunity to really work with each other. You were giving some suggestions, I was giving some suggestions, we were on opposite sides of the room. We didn't even, I don't think we even had a discussion or a conversation, but from that moment we, I kind of, I think we represent like a very similar personality type, that even though we do different work, we talk about the same issues, because those are the issues of the world. So we kind of resonated with each other. We became Facebook friends like you do with people that you work with. <laughs> and um, that was it for a little while. And then Hidane just called me one day, I think. You just gave me a call, didn't you? And you said that this is the project that I would like to do. These are the ideas. And we had about a 45 minute discussion. And in this discussion, we spoke purely about the art, about what his why was, the reason, where he was coming from, and what he specifically wanted to do in the world and the impact that it was going to make. And that's why I said yes. It wasn't to do with the martial arts or to do with anything else. We didn't speak about the when we would do it. We didn't even speak about how. I didn't actually know it was a film at that time. Um, we didn't know, I didn't know anything. I didn't know the fee. I didn't know where. I didn't know when. We didn't talk about those kinds of things. We spoke as artists on the same level, having this discussion. and. Then we had several more discussions, and how long do I have? Couple minutes. Great. So if you guys wouldn't mind, then I'll give you a little bit of an insight behind the scenes of how many by show of hands have just seen the film? Anyone seen the film? Yeah, great. So if I can have your permission, I'll share some behind the scenes insights with you guys. Yeah. So what we did was got into the rehearsal room, and at this time we had no preconceived idea. Well, I had no preconceived ideas, meaning I hadn't created the choreography. But I had asked Hidane a whole bunch of questions as to what he likes and most importantly what he doesn't like and why we were doing this project. So we got into the rehearsal room and the very first thing that we did was we sat down and we watched clips of Kung Fu movies because I really needed to know stylistically what Hidane likes. And for a while now, I haven't done any fight choreography as such. I've been doing theatre, so my own theatre work, for example, Fangs of Fortune, which is looking for a 2019 tour, um, where, it, again, it, we use so many different art forms, but it all has to come together, and it's about no language. It's actually about breaking down culture. It's about a, the story of two snake spirits who fall in love with humans and how this is forbidden love because this is just not allowed. It comes from an ancient Chinese legend. But for me, everything has to be about that layering that we have to break down these barriers, we have to break down these walls between different art forms, we have to break down these walls and connect and unify different cultures, etc. That's why nonverbal communication is so important to me. So we sat down, we firstly broke down the barriers of the dancers and myself. So what, do the, what could the dancers already do? Because a martial artist will do martial arts with whatever he does. He'll point in a certain direction and he'll become martial arts. It's just the way it is because he's got that feeling. But the dancers have never done martial arts. So the first thing was to watch some films, see some clips, see what Hidane liked and what he didn't like stylistically, and then to see what the dancers were capable of in their body. How flexible were they? How high could they jump? What could they do? Because I really want to create something that would serve them and their bodies really well. So we worked on that, and so the choreography process began. And when I first met Louise, she was doing the, the sign language in a way that I resonated with again, because Another part of what I did for a long while was physical theatre. So physical theatre is the idea of using your body as an instrument of communication. And I noticed what Louise was doing really worked in conjunction with this. So I thought instead of us creating again like this camel of different ideas, we've got here sign language and here we've got Kung Fu, we could try and put these two things together. We could take the sign language and make Kung Fu moves out of them and we could take Kung Fu and put them in, put it into sign language because the human body can only do a certain number of things and I really think that it's important that we 
we look at the similarities instead of the differences. There are too many people looking at differences in the world, differences between different cultures, but the human body and nonverbal communication are universal. Everybody has them, everyone's got the same body and they can communicate in exactly the same way. And that's really what unites us instead of divides us. So that's what really resonated with me and so this project happened and it began. And here we are today. So, thank you. Great. Thank you. Fantastic. Well, loads of thoughts there. Um, I just uh, wondered if anyone had a, had a question or a thought that they'd like to start off with. I'm going to repeat the question and if you could put your hand up um, so that we make sure that we're not crossing over um, uh, questions. <laughs> yes. Was anyone involved in the project, um, the dancers, were, were any of them deaf? So I'll just repeat the question, were any of the dancers in the film, uh, the fight, deaf? Uh, none of the main dancers, uh, the two main protagonists that you see, Vicky and Freddie, they weren't deaf. Uh, the, the only deaf protagonist in the film was the um, priestess um, who you would have seen conducting the ceremony. Okay, any, any um, other thoughts about the subject of nonverbal communication? Yes. Okay. So I think the idea of fusing, you know, that sort of physical expression of creativity that the dance with the physical expression of linguistic creativity, which is the sign language, is genuinely fascinating and unifying. But one thing that I find really interesting is that you've got the division of audience. And so the, the, the audience member who understands sign language is going to have a much more literal relationship with the art, whereas the audience member who does not understand sign language, that's going to, it's going to add a layer of mystique to their relationship with the art. And I wonder if any of the panel have any sort of strong opinions about that difference and how it affects the different uh, relationships that the audience have. Or maybe have that affected what elements went into the work in the first place. Okay, so I'm just going to summarise that question for the microphones. Uh, so uh, your observation was that um, uh, people, when they encounter the film, who who don't understand sign language, there's a mystique about it. Uh, but sign language and um, and the choreography are a unifying force. Um, but so your um, observation is that it divides the audience because people have. Um, uh, people who are be uh, sign language users have a more um, direct experience of it. I hope I summarised that okay. <laughs> okay, so any comments on that from the panel? I'd like to start. Um, I, the, so that was quite purposeful in a way. So as I intended from the beginning that there would be no subtitles uh, on the film. And the potential way that the audience might be divided in a way I think hopefully is more complex in the sense that I think everyone has a slightly different access to the film depending on your background and that isn't just linguistically um, but also culturally, gender wise, whatever it might be so you know if you're from a, you could say that a deaf audience might understand um, linguistically clearer what is being said by the priestess uh, if you speak BSL but also you, a deaf audience would have a different relationship to the soundtrack, um, a different access to the music, different access to the sound folly. Um, if you're from a particular Afro-African uh, background, that uh, might, might be, um, uh, have, a different, have a particular kind of relationship to um, the, the costume or certain ritualistic aspects, then you'll have another diff different kind of uh, insight into the film or connection to the film than if you know nothing about those cultures. If you have a particular background in martial arts, uh, you'll have maybe a greater access to certain parts than everyone else gets. If you have a particular um, interest in uh, particular costumes or uh, whatever it might be. So I think there's lots of different elements in this film that might offer different people, different points of access into the film. So I kind of feel like, hopefully, it's kind of puts things out on an equal playing field. 
And, and, I, and I guess I'm interested, one of the reasons that I wanted it so that everyone doesn't have this same access to everything is because I think there's lots of signifiers in the work that you can recognise. People, ceremony, a church, a confrontation, something romantic, that hopefully there's enough stuff there that it, it sort of puts us in a position where we use our own human faculties to try to fill in the gaps, um, to understand the rest of what we might not um, uh, understand directly from it. I don't know if Louise feels it, uh, differently to that. No, I completely agree with what you said, and I have something to add, um, if that would be okay. So my first response is going to be a bit more literal. The kind of sign language that's represented in eruption um, that I showed earlier, and the kind of sign language that we used throughout the piece, um, aside from what the priestess um, says in the ceremony, the rest of it um, is a type of vocabulary within sign language that has no fixed rules or meaning. So there's a set of rules that dictate what kind of movement feels correct. And there are rules about what doesn't feel correct, but there's no specific signs. So if somebody were to show up, so if something tangible shows up, you can use those set of rules to then describe those things um, in a way that's fluid. But there's no equivalence to that in spoken language or in written language in the Western world. So then for a deaf audience member, they might be more familiar with that way of communicating, but it, it's not about interpreting the vocabulary that's being shown because the vocabulary has no equivalence in written or spoken language. It's very fluid. Um, and we did this intentionally in the design. If we use different specific vocabulary, the way that I'm communicating right now to, to talk with all of you, I know Helsa will interpret, um, I know that you'll understand my words in spoken English, so I'm now giving uh, uh, examples that are using specific words so that I can be interpreted. But if we use this type of vocabulary in the piece, then I think that your question would be more, um, would be relevant. Not to say that your question is irrelevant, it's, it's a valid question, but I think that there's different ways of coming at it. Now if Hattain used the kind of vocabulary that we're using now in his piece, similar to how the priestess communicated, then I think that it would be a much less interesting piece of work. But Hattain chose not to do that, so for me that was very exciting. And it actually makes it more accessible to a, a general audience. At first, you may feel like, oh, I don't understand what's happening. I don't know what they're saying. But actually, it is open to you. You don't have to know a, the specific code that's being used to understand it. And then the other thing that I, that I can add to what you've said, if you create a work for television, a, a television show, perhaps, you don't really think about, well, this is not going to be accessible to people that don't speak English. Or you don't think when you're creating it, this is not going to be accessible to a deaf audience. You don't think about, well, this is not going to be accessible to all these you know, various groups. You just make the piece. You just make the show, the program. And our culture now is having a lot more discussions about minority cultures and diversity. That's a very hot topic, which is great. But often, this forces us to create work that just ticks the boxes. And I think that's, that's really quite depressing to be creating work in that way. So the fact that Hattain has decided to make a piece, he's created a world, um, it's original, it's, it's complete, and it includes some things that are unfamiliar to some people, I think that's okay. So the question is, um, how, what was your script editing like, and how did it change along the way? So um, in, I initially didn't have a, a script, and it was more about an impulse um, about a relationship between two people. It was about how a physical thing might evolve 
um, that's to do with language, but also to do something outside of language. Uh, and so I'm not sure. Yeah, we had it quite early. Once, once we decided on the idea that it would be a wedding ceremony, uh, which partly came through the venue, it was initially going to be a pre-wedding like ceremony in, in, a, in, in a household and that changed due to the venue that we ended up working with. Um, I wrote a set of wedding vows, uh, which were not traditional wedding vows, uh, which were partly to do with, I, don't, I won't read them out because I think it's better not to have them uh, exactly, but they were kind of more about, um, about uh, this, ceremony potentially being about self-discovery um, as much as it is about a union between two people uh, and so that's so I started writing that and then I would send this to Louise um, and then Louise and I in a studio together before we had the dancers started working on how this would be physicalized so the language which Louise just spoke about uh, just now she started to explore this through my body so, you know, looking at suggestions of how I might physicalise it, we tried a few things and discussed what it would mean to go one way or another, and I would kind of think about how they felt, um, I would record these things and we would look at them, and so we would develop them together this way. Uh, and then when we brought the dancers in, um, we started to put those things onto them, and of course Louise was there, and so we kind of, again, just as Chirag built the, the fight choreography around the dancers' bodies, um, Louise and I were also able to input on how those dancers would express those things. Um, and so the, 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 the signing vows part of that was developed that way. And then in terms of the things that were less, um, which were not to do with uh, any kind of language as such, um, w actually kind of developed through the rehearsal process. So, for example, I didn't know for a long time how the film would end. Uh, I knew that I wanted to go through these fight processes, I knew that I the costume transformations that I wanted and what I wanted them to mean, but I didn't know how it would end. And it was only when we were rehearsing and putting stuff together that the ritualistic part of this connection, people touching and coming together at the end, and this kind of circling, that that kind of started to fall into place. So it's partly to do with who was in the room and what it felt like and kind of what these things that we did know, some of the choreography, some of the linguistic parts, some of the intention, what they would present as, as an ending, if you like. So I think that's maybe how the script, if you can call it that, um, developed. Can I? Mm -hmm. yeah. So that's in the in the macro, but in the micro, as I was choreographing the uh, fight as well, I had an idea in my mind, which again I won't tell you literally. I think it's best to leave that to your imagination. But each each part of the fight was like a question and answer. They were supposed to it was supposed to be like a conversation between the two. Mm -hmm. So if you notice when you see the the fight happen, it's never like one is more dominant or the other one. There's, it's like one is speaking and the other is listening, moving back, and then the other one is speaking, the other one is moving. One is high, one is low. We're having it's like a conversation. They actually represent the each other's other half, really. So that's how that was created. So in my mind, there was always this conversation, this scripting happening. And I even took other elements because we had some discussions about rituals from around the world. And again, we were taking a look at what's you what's unified between these rituals. You had these things about steps and people, the way that they walk down the aisle, walk around a fire, whatever that is, and we took that. So there are elements of step work in the Kung Fu which are taken from this as well. So there was always scripting in the back of my mind even as I was creating the fight choreography. Yes? Do you feel that you're creating an active play in terms of our understanding of violent culture or are you trying to give us a similar experience of niceness? So, so the question is, <laughs> uh, are you trying to uh, create a debate around violence? Um, um, Tane, yeah. do you mind if I try this? Um, have you seen a movie called The Tribe? 
It's a really good film. It is a Ukrainian uh, film that uses sign language. If you think that this was dark, you should really see this. <laughs> um, it's seriously dark. And it, there's a spectrum, right? There's a spectrum. There's dark and there's not dark, there's light. And Sesame Street is for children. Um, and I love Sesame Street growing up. Um, I watched it and I know the deaf woman um, on the program and I'm very appreciative that it gave people exposure to sign language. But I do think it gave um, the wrong impression that sign language is something, uh, it's all just fluff and lovely, right? But sign language is used just like any other language. People need to express darkness and they do it through language. And as an adult, you need more language to be able to express that. Um, that's the appropriate mirror to reflect uh, reality. So it's not just, you know, not just showing the sugary coated, you know, version of, of who we are as people. Um, and sign language is just functions just like any other language. When things need to be expressed, they need to be expressed. Um, I don't think that this piece is, um, is at the far end at all of, 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 of darkness that can be expressed. Um, I would really encourage you to watch The Tribe. Yeah, it's great. Um, I, I say, should say in terms of, it wasn't my intention necessarily to talk about violence in cinema, but um, I am I, one of my reasons for this work in there, for the physicality in there, is I guess to, again, to make suggestions that exuberance, that... Um, drama or kind of the body used in very dynamic physical ways doesn't necessarily have to be violent. That even when it's, even if it uses something like martial arts, I think lots of martial arts is not violent. Like when you watch films, it looks like choreography or dance, or sometimes I find it hard to find violence in, uh, in kung fu films. It feels kind of a bit bubblegum or a bit kind of showy. Uh, and actually in this, I mean, I'm interested in that the idea that combat or something which might be seen like combat might not be combative, that might not be what we s assume it might be. And it's not just with fight that I'm trying to do this with, it's with every single element in the film. So it's with, uh, you know, in terms of trying to upturn your assumptions about every element in the film, you know, this idea that you might feel it's a wedding ceremony and then is it a fight or is it uh, an African ritual but then it becomes East Asian through martial arts or whatever it might be. So I'm, I'm interested in, in each language or each element being pushed around a bit so it doesn't sit fully comfortably in the way that it's typically represented. Uh, does that <laughs> if I could just add to it as well, the, the, for me, there is never violence in martial arts at all. I never see it like that. If I see a, a martial arts film, I've never, I can never actually see violence in that. I see art, so the art part. The martial is just where it comes from, the tradition that it comes from, that is an art of war. And the idiom that we're using, the language that we're using here, is that of a fight but when you take it out of that context it becomes something else and that's the that's the difference because when we were in the rehearsal room we were joking and messing around because every so often we would quote a bruce lee film or a something and we just kept doing this backwards and forwards and the one that we continued to quote was because of certain moves that we were doing was don't concentrate on the finger or you'll miss all the heavenly glory from Bruce Lee's Enter the Dragon. That's where the name came from. And we were sat in a cafe and Hidane said to me, this might be the name. And I was like, wow, <laughs> mind blown. That's the thing. So he, the point of this philosophy in the Tao of Jeet Kune Do, he says that if you concentrate on the finger, so he says, is, he says it's like a finger pointing away to the moon. The guy is concentrating on the finger and he says if you concentrate on the finger, you'll miss what you're supposed to be looking at. And like that, it's if we're looking at that this is sign language or this is fighting or in my work that this is Chinese classical dance or this is uh, seal wheel acrobatics, then we're missing the point of what it was about at the 
So we're seeing it on one level, which is great because we want that to be entertainment. And through entertainment, we can create education. So earlier we joked about it and I said it's edutainment because we're entertaining, but giving that, that education with, beneath the mass. And that's what's really important because if we see on that one level, great, we all went away and we were at least entertained for the time that the film was on. But if we want to make an impact, then we have to look beyond that and see what all of the other layers were as well. So that's a really good observation. Thank you. Okay. Um, so we've got a couple more questions. I'm, I'm aware of time. So, Could I just like yeah. to this? Um, the spy take on um, film is um, more to do with ritual and also to do with the fact that these two people haven't met before. And a lot of the things that you're exploring is looking at um, how you can have that chemistry with someone and how you may need your own instinct, your own intuition and look at that chemistry and that synchronicity and really synch yeah, synchronicity with someone. And I think the choreography and the movements do that because the way that they respond is not this kind of conflict in the movement. It, there is this fluidity even in the, um, the movement where there is the kind of combat and there is more kind of value. There's this kind of, there's still a kindness in there. There's, it brings it back into this kind of chemistry mm -hmm. and this So I don't really see it in, in that way. It seems to be different. You watch different, different TV programs to me. That's my take on yeah, thank you. Um, one a question at the back there. Um, I'm sort of interested in, the, in, in how you went into this and take um, in terms of, um, you know, was there the constraints that, that, that were on the project so when you went into it? Um, I'm thinking, you know, was there a deadline and did you have a time in, in mind when you were thinking about the, the, the length of the film? Um, was there a budget to work to? Did you need to be in a gallery or a book that you shown elsewhere? Um, did you, could it, you know, was it just necessary to have able people in there? How do you think about it? Um, you know, other, other types of disabilities and stuff. Um, you know, could it have been sumo versus, you know, kung fu? Um, you know, could it have been white people as opposed to African? You know, when you when you, when you went into these things, um, did you have any preconceptions of, of the thing that you were going into, or did you just go into it as a blank piece of paper? Okay, so a massive list of questions there. <laughs> so lots of questions about logistics, uh, I'm saying, I'm reading, um, and questions about, um, I guess, how preconceptions of what it might have been and, and what it could have been and what it is. Sure. So, <laughs> um, I, I guess I always knew I wanted it to be a gallery work. So the, the, the other work that you see in there, The Jump, um, this, this new work doc was going to be a follow-up to that, and it was, I had in my mind that it would be a series of three works, of which I've not made the third, on my journey to make my first feature film, and that these three works would provide kind of different thinking grounds for me to, to, make, to work towards a feature film, but that each of these works would be works in themselves. Um, I, I knew it wanted to be in a gallery context because um, of the freedom that allows me. It allows me to think outside of what a film traditionally needs to be. It wouldn't necessarily need to be a single screen. If I wanted it, it could be multiple screens if the idea went that way, or it could be on tiny TVs or projected on the ceiling, which is different to if it's for a film industry <coughs> or something like that. Um, the idea initially was going to be, and so it was when I started having conversations with all the producers and the commissioners, Film and Video Umbrella, Manstrat Gallery and Quad, the, the timeline was kind of from when the exhibitions would be, which was plenty of time actually, kind of. Uh, I say plenty of time to make the work, but a lot of the time was, was spent in producing, so trying to find the money to do it. So that took a long time, but we got a good budget that, that we needed. Um, initially the idea was that it was going to be me and my brother having a kung fu fight in my grandma's living room or in my grandma's uh, kitchen as a follow up to the jump which is my family in my grandma's living room and the reason that I changed that is partly to do with the context that was going to be here at Manchester actually um, the new north and south uh, context of uh, bringing lots of artists from, uh, from South Asia um, I was thinking about that context and I, and I knew it would be a high profile show and it would be on for a long time and it would be exhibited really well and so I thought if people come across my work for the first time I wouldn't want them to think 
if by seeing those two works that I'm, I solely make autobiographical work with just my family in there. So, that, so I decided to change the ethnicity uh, of who it would be. Uh, and I also feel that if socio-politically that my work is able to do what I want it to do, that it shouldn't need me, my biography, my family, that um, it could be somebody else. Uh, and so the change of ethnicity, I kind of felt, it, because, I'm, because I wanted to play with changing expectations, I didn't want it to be a, an East Asian cast uh, because of uh, the martial arts we were using. Um, and I also didn't want it to be, let's say, a white English cast uh, because I'm interested in um, um, identities on screen that are underrepresented um, <coughs> and putting those identities on screen and doing what we don't see with them. Uh, and that isn't necessarily just about the fiction of it, because of course the work is a fiction, but it's asking, why not? You know, like Louise spoke about, um, of course sign language is going to speak about violence and, and all nasty things as well as all positive things just because it's a language and it expresses what humans express. So I was also wanting to put out there, of course, maybe a ritual could be this. You know, there's so many weird and wonderful rituals out there. I question all the time all the rituals that happen from my own background, where they come from, why they're, they're there. And to, so for me, the idea that a ritual could be as part of someone's history, that they fight as part of a ceremony, isn't so strange. Uh, if you compare it to why in an Indian wedding would you walk around a fire uh, many times, it's the same thing to me. Um, and so, um, so, that, so those kind of things developed that way. I would say the things that, I would say lots of the elements, even though I had from right from the start, I knew that I wanted it so that if you walk into that installation and just catch a glimpse, you should feel as though you are walking in on an expensive Hollywood film. Um, that's what I wanted from the start. And uh, although we didn't have a budget of an expensive Hollywood film, um, I was interested in ways to do that. So how we film it, the, the richness and depth of the costumes, we put a lot of budget into those costumes. Um, and you know, making sure that my collaborators um, were at such a high level that they are. And then actually, as the, as the ambition was kind of, uh, as I kind of spoke about the ambition to the rest of the group and as they started to see things forming, actually every single one of those collaborators, I felt went beyond, you know, above and beyond, you know, kind of what they were brought on the project to do. I feel like everyone really went for it to a point where it was just like, you know, quite wild in what people brought to the table. And so that's, this is why I was sort of joking earlier, sort of saying, you know, even the end product, I'm like, wow. <laughs> you know, um, so I, I'd always had a massive high ambition for it, but to kind of see it, um, kind of getting there and, you know, going beyond that actually uh, is, is, is pretty special. Great. Well, we are out of time. Um, thank you so much um, for coming today and for all your comments and questions. Um, I'd just like to say a huge thank you to Shirak, to Hete, to Louise, to Alex and Siobhan and to Helsa um, for coming here together today to, um, to um, be here to talk and discuss. Um, the film is on until the 4th of February, so tell everybody who you know who hasn't seen it to come and see it. Um, so it's on until the 4th of February. If you wouldn't mind just filling in one of these quick audience feedback forms before you leave, uh, that would be really helpful for us because um, uh, our whole project is funded by the Arts Council and we just need to give them a little bit of um, data on some of the events that have been happening. So that would be really, it won't take long. So yeah, just want to say a huge thank you to everybody. <laughs>